Good morning and welcome. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank in Philadelphia. Uh, this morning we have a very interesting discussion for you with Seamus Hughes, uh, moderated by uh, Ron Granieri, our very own Ron Granieri. Uh, Seamus Hughes and his co-author Alexander uh, Mel Melagru Hitchens, uh, Alexander won't be here today, but Seamus Hughes is, and they are both the author of a recent book, Homegrown, ISIS in America. Uh, Ron Granieri will be moderating the discussion. Ron, as many of you know, is the executive director of FBRI's Center for the Study of America and the West. He's also a Templeton Fellow, and he's a history professor at the U.S. Army War College. As always, we are obliged to say that any comments he makes do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the War College, the U.S. Army, or the Department of Defense. And I would also add that any, any, um, any opinions uh, expressed today do not reflect FPRI either. Um, uh, a, a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, we have um, three really terrific upcoming events this week, um, uh, this mornings. And then of course on Thursday, we have, that's Thursday, December 3rd at 10 a.m. We're going to have a conversation between our Robert strauss pay chair, Robert, Kaplan and Princeton professor Stephen Kotkin. Um, and they're going to be talking about China after communism. Um, and then on Friday, uh, December 4th at 10 a.m. also, we're going to have a conversation on the future of the RCEP. For those of you who would like a, a translation of what that means, we're talking about the recently penned uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Agreement, uh, Economic Partnership. This is the... Um, the economic uh, agreement that was signed by China and most of the nations in Asia and Southeast Asia. And uh, Jacques Delisle will be leading a discussion, Jacques Delisle, who's our Asia program director with the Wilson Center's uh, Shihoko Goto. So before I turn it over to Ron, um, I'd like to do a few housekeeping things. First of all, the, uh, the Q&A button is at the bottom of the screen. Please use that if you have questions and go ahead and start entering them whenever you wish. Um, and the chat window, uh, we have in the chat window a link to, um, to Seamus's and Alexander's book. Um, as, as well as an opportunity for those of you who want to support us or become members, there should be a link in there for that as well. Also use the chat if you have any technical issues, we will try to address them for you. Um, and finally, before I turn this over, a sincere thank you to our supporters and our donors and our board members. Um, can't do this without you. Also, we're making a video of this, which will be online, um, usually within 24 hours. If you want to relive the experience or if you miss part of it and would like to listen to it again, uh, or recommend it, of course, to others. So without further ado, let me turn the reins over to Ron. Thank you, Raleigh. And thanks, everybody. Uh, it's delight, delightful to see you all here. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's new program of conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I'm Ron Granary, and I am, as ever, uh, happy on behalf of FPRI to welcome you to this program. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. Between 2011 and 2014, the growth of the ISIS caliphate appeared unstoppable taking advantage of both the unsettled environment of post-war Iraq and the collapse of all authority in civil war-torn Syria. As the caliphate grew, so did its appeal to believers eager to join the struggle. ISIS recruiters reached out to Muslim communities around the world, creating tension and raising the specter of radicalization within even settled Muslim communities within the West. In their new book, Homegrown, ISIS in America, Today's guest, Seamus Hughes, along with his collaborators, Alexander Melagru Hitchens and Bennett Clifford, offer an analysis of ISIS recruitment efforts in the United States. Although relatively few Americans made the pilgrimage to the caliphate compared to their European co-religionists, domestic attacks by individuals who pledged allegiance to ISIS 
most famously, Omar Mateen in Orlando, Florida, and the husband and wife team of Tashfin Malik and Syed Farouk in San Bernardino, California, fed concerns about the possibility of even bigger attacks in the future. In their book, the authors argue that jihadism in America is a truly homegrown phenomenon. Though it's lost its caliphate, ISIS has already demonstrated its ability to adapt and evolve while always keeping America firmly in its sights. Even more disturbing, despite concerns about secure borders and Muslim migration to the United States, the vast majority of jihadists who have become connected to ISIS are U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents. With such insights, homegrown deepens our understanding of the complexity and resiliency of jihadism in the West as a movement that will continue to make its presence felt, both in Europe and the United States, for the foreseeable future. So how successful has ISIS been in attracting recruits within Muslim communities in the West? How does the American experience with ISIS compare to other nations and other regions' experiences? How can an understanding of the past help us to craft policy for the future? These questions and yours will guide us in discussion with Seamus Hughes. And Seamus Hughes is the Deputy Director of the Program on Extremism at George Washington University. He has authored numerous reports for the program, including ISIS in America, From Retweets to Raqqa, and The Travelers, American Jihadists in Syria and Iraq. In addition to testifying before Congress on multiple occasions, uh, Seamus Hughes regularly provides commentary to media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, the BBC, and PBS. And to add to those acronyms, we are delighted to say he is now here to appear on FPRI. So welcome to People, Politics, and Prose on FPRI, Seamus Hughes. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've been a follower of FPRIs for a number of years. It's been a go-to place for research for analysts, um, both inside and outside of DC. So thank you to you and to Raleigh for uh, having us. You bet. You bet. It's great to have you here to talk about your book. And I remind the audience as well, if as questions occur to you, please enter them using the Q&A button on your uh, Zoom so that uh, I can integrate them into our conversation. We're always interested to hear from you. So to start us off, Seamus, what's the history of the research project that led to this book? Yeah, it's a, it's a history of, of getting frustrated. Uh, <laughs> so what happened was my colleagues, Alex and um, Bennett and I, you know, we had this question of what does ISIS in America look like? And this seems like a loaded term, right? Are we talking about thousands of people? Are we talking about five people? Um, and then the full answer is we didn't really know. And so um, the, the point of it was, let's figure out the puzzle. Mm-hmm. And so we went through about 20,000 pages of legal documents. We just got on planes and, and talked to FBI agents or U.S. attorneys or defense attorneys or um, individuals that were in ISIS and came back and, 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 and family members of them. Um, because we wanted to figure out what it actually means. Like, what's the general scope of this problem? Uh, and so the impetus was basically we, we had a riddle and we wanted to solve it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure we solved it, but we got damn near closer than we, we, we did three years ago. You, you, you said something that, uh, you know, future, future generations will have to have explained to them. You mean you got on planes and you traveled know, huh? to talk to people pers- face-to-face? Yeah, back in the day um, when you could finally get some, some information based on a, a coffee or a beer um, after work. You know, like my background is as an, a congressional investigator. So mm-hmm. I was always taught that if you couldn't get the answer in D.C., you needed to leave D.C. and go talk to people in the field who would know the answer. And so um, we had no shame doing that whatsoever. What was your time frame for doing this research? Was this in the last three years, in the last two years? How, how, how long were you doing it? Yeah, so we, we've been working on the book for about three years now. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And originally we thought we'd be able to turn this around pretty quickly. Um, but the more we dug, the more we realized that if you wanted to take, tell the full story of ISIS recruitment in America, you had to wait. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just two weeks ago, we had two cases unsealed in Pennsylvania of a, a husband and wife that were funding their their family to go join ISIS, right? And if we had put out the book, you know, months ago, we wouldn't have been able to to have that information in there, right? So it just takes a little bit of time for things to get unsealed, for people to be willing to talk, for people to get out of jail, to be fair, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. to have that level of of interaction, um, I think that's really really why it took so long. And not just because I have a really bad writer's block, right? Uh, It had more to do with trying to get the research. 
well, I've got a lot of sympathy with that. So I wouldn't, uh, there's no shame in that part. Yeah. But the, um, how, does, uh, how does this project fit in with the larger work of the program on extremism at GW? So we launched the, the program extremism um, about five years ago, mm-hmm. uh, June 2015. Um, Lorenzo Vedino is our director and, and myself when we first started. An FPRI fellow, we should add to Yes, that. absolutely. A uh, big fan of FPRI uh, and, and got me hooked on all of your research. Um, and so we, we had a, a goal, which is relatively simple. Um, look at extremism in America in a nonpartisan um, and, and you know, just the facts, ma'am, approach. And so uh, we started seeing the phenomenon of ISIS rising in terms of the arrests in America. And so we tracked that the same amount of time. And every month we put out an ISIS tracker of everyone who gets arrested and things like that. Uh, we also looked at, at non-jihadist stuff. So um, far-right extremists, uh, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, anti-government um, folks too. So basically any Tom, Dick, and Harry in the U.S. who's joined an extremist or violent extremist group, uh, we try our best to get a sense of, of why. Well, and, and so uh, I imagine your lunchtime conversations back when people had lunchtime conversations uh, must be pretty spectacular if everybody shows up talking about which terrible group they happen to be uh, researching. Yeah, we're, we're a joy at cocktail parties. <laughs> well, and um, we've, we've already gotten a couple of questions about other organizations. And so I am curious, when you think about ISIS, uh, we're going we're gonna to get into a discussion about jihadism and Muslim extremism, but uh, in what ways do we or can we generalize about, uh, let's say, radical groups? Or extre- if, you, if you talk about, if it's a program on extremism, how do we generalize what, what makes a group extremist? And it, are the, um, basically, do you tend to be more lumpers or splitters at the program on extremism? Do you look for similarities or do you emphasize the, the things that make different extreme groups different from each other? Yeah, we tend to focus on the ideology uh, in many ways, but there are some similarities between groups, right? Um, the younger folks that are drawn to ISIS uh, are usually have the same kind of characteristics of folks that are drawn to, say, neo-Nazi movements in the U.S., right? Mm-hmm. Um, tend to be angry, tend to have a, a, want a sense of belonging, and want to be bigger than, than, than themselves. And so mm-hmm. whether that be ISIS, the local uh, clan rally, that, that provides them that outlet to do so. Um, now, of course, there's always outliers in that scenario, right? You've got the the big thinkers who think about these things in, in nuanced ways. But when you're talking about ISIS cases, they tend to be uh, more of the hotheads um, than anything else. And that, I think that's true of, of other movements right now. Um, do you have any examples of people who are, uh, uh, let's say, extremist or cafeteria extremists who move from group to group? Or do people tend to slot themselves early on in their extremist careers? Yes, yeah, I guess since I'm talking to a Pennsylvania crowd, I might as well use a Pennsylvania example. So. Sure. A good example of that would be Emerson Magali uh, from mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, who was um, raised as a, a Nazi sympathizer by his uh, father, and then transferred his his interest to Al Shabaab, a terrorist organization in Somalia. Um, you do see this kind of what the FBI calls a cocktail of ideologies. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Choose your own adventure, right? And we can even look at, at someone like Omar Mateen, who um, committed an attack in in the Pulse nightclub and killed dozens, right? He was investigated originally for Hezbollah, um, mm-hmm. and then Hamas, and then uh, Al Qaeda, and then ultimately um, committed the act in the name of ISIS. Right? Some mixing a cocktail there. Um, you, you see a lot more of that in the domestic terrorism extremists. So um, there's a group called the Boogaloo Boys uh, who wear Hawaiian shirts and want to commit uh, acts of violence in order to further civil rights or civil war um, in this country. They also don't mind working with um, Hamas members or, or, or incel members, right? Um, they're not particularly, they're, they're ideologically agnostic sometimes. Interesting. Uh, and and because this gets into the issue of when we, when we talk about ISIS sponsoring groups, we have a, a question here from Ed Trevisani, for example, asks about the funding question is um, if we think of people who are or are not connected to an organization like ISIS, um, how much material support are we talking about here versus sort of providing the, um, the intellectual kit for, a, uh, for, an extremist, for extremist behavior? Sure. Uh, you know, when you talk about material support, so it's a, it's a U.S. code, like a, a law, right? Material support to terrorism. Uh, it's a very broad statute. And that mm-hmm. material support can be giving hot chocolate to a guy in Syria to uh, giving money to getting on a plane. And the material can be yourself. Mm-hmm. providing yourself as personnel, right? 
Um, most of our cases tend to be small dollars. Uh, not a whole lot of money is coming in from ISIS. In fact, when you look at the ISIS in America cases, only one case that we know of where ISIS sent $5,000 into Maryland to a guy to commit an attack in Texas. Most of it ends up being American sending money out. So mm -hmm. Western Union, um, $50, $250 type of, of stuff. You're also talking about small ball um, costs, right? You're, it doesn't cost a whole lot of money to get a, a plane ticket to Turkey uh, mm -hmm. or to buy a gun or to get a rental car and drive um, through a crowd. And so when we looked at the cases in, in America, relatively small footprint, um, but occasionally you have like a student loan fraud. You know, you, you take out a huge student loan and then you use the money to, to give to ISIS, but mostly you're talking about small amounts of money. Mm -hmm. and but even like, uh, yeah, I, go ahead. I'm gonna go circle back around as a, as a good professor, which is <laughs> we had a case of material support of a woman in Missouri who got arrested for providing a Swiss Miss hot chocolate to an ISIS member in Syria because he really missed the trappings of home, right? So, so that's not just a metaphor, that is providing, not just providing a, hot chocolate. That is, that is four and a half years in jail. Um, that is what she got sentenced for. for really? Sending right. hot chocolate, yeah. Well, and, and, but I guess then the issue was, is which directions do the support go in? Because the idea is, is, does ISIS or is ISIS, uh, uh, do they funnel any of their uh, wealth? Uh, uh, do they spend that money supporting groups abroad or do they just, uh, or do the groups, the, the activities that we see say here in the United States, does that, uh, do they operate based on their own funding and ISIS is just the, uh, the cheerleader? I mean, it's usually the money's going out and that money's going out and not coming in. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, listen, ISIS does spend some money to, to support uh, the ISIS infrastructure here. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean, um, you know, a good example of that would be there was six um, men and women in Raqqa who were part of something called the Legion, the FBI called the Legion, the Legion of Doom. And these were folks who had um, time and space to spend the entire time reaching out to Americans to commit attacks in, in the U.S. So providing a level of support, um, you know, here's a, a knife to buy, here's the address of the local military officer to kill, things like that. Now, ISIS let those six people, paid their salary for for two years to do so, gave them all the phones they wanted to do because they saw that as an investment, actually a low-end investment for a high-end return. Uh, with, and so you do see the money getting spent, but usually in Syria and Iraq. Interesting. Well, and, and so uh, this gets to the, the phenomenon of lone wolf terrorism, right? The phrase is used to describe people. And uh, is it misleading, say, to, to talk about an Omar Mateen uh, as a lone wolf, or even to talk about the, um, uh, since we're coming up on the fifth anniversary of the San Bernardino killings, um, if we think about the couple that committed those crimes, uh, uh, you know, how much, how much direct support does one have to be able to show to a larger organization uh, in order to have that person classified as a, uh, as somebody who's working for that organization rather than being a lone wolf? And does the distinction even matter when we try to understand the phenomenon? It gets mixed very quickly. Um, you know, lone wolf or even lone actor, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably a better way to, to categorize it. Lone, lone wolf assumes that this person kind of works in a vacuum. I think mm -hmm. a lone actor is a level of connection, right? Mm -hmm. Like Omar Mateen, for example, um, during the middle of his attack at the Pulse nightclub, calls um, 911 and says he's committing this attack on behalf of um, justification for a drone strike that killed a mid-level ISIS um, commander, right? So he had... Um, no known ties to ISIS in terms of formal ties. He wasn't communicating with anyone. But this is the guy who was plugged in and was watching who was the latest guy who got killed that week from a, from a drone attack. So mm -hmm. he wasn't working in a vacuum. Um, and in fact, when you pull back the onion to this stuff, you see that um, a lot of these individuals may commit an attack by themselves, but were part of a larger bubble of folks who maybe didn't cross a legal threshold, but for sure okay with ISIS at the dinner table sitting around the table, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it really, there is a larger group that we can't really um, quantify, um, but I don't think we can say these people happen to, to just one day get off and decide to do something. I gotcha. Well, and, and so um, how, if at all, do, uh, uh, do ISIS efforts to appeal to Americans differ from uh, their appeals elsewhere? Do they, do they target? Uh, in, a, in a marketing sense, yeah. uh, if, if I can be, if I can use that bad, uh, uh, that bad analogy, but do they target uh, audiences in the United States differently than they target audiences elsewhere? 
Uh, they target, in terms of recruitment, it's about the same for Europe and, and, and America. And by that, I mean, it's a lot of hand-holding, or at least it was. Um, mm -hmm. You're not talking about, you know, the good old days, you and I used to watch, you know, Adam Gadan give a speech, who was a third in command in Al-Qaeda, and, and he would talk about, for 45 minutes, he'd drone on about something, right? Um, but it was a broad-based speech, whereas the ISIS individuals were, were basically um, recruiters. And so they would be whispering in a person's ear for hours on end, for weeks on end. And so it's a sustained recruitment in a way that we hadn't seen before. So they had the message and the product of the caliphate, but they also had an infrastructure to, to reinforce that and try to get those sales, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a question here from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Ben uh, Pributok on the question of, talk about, we talk about the internet, we talk about social media. Um, what are the other, uh, or uh, what are the other kinds of, of incubators that are used to draw people in or to uh, attract people to ISIS? Uh, are there connections with other particular organizations? Uh, you know, do, do we see a, do we see a, let's say a progression, if you will, from a, uh, a local radical organization that eventually puts you in touch with ISIS further down the line? Yeah, it entirely depends on the case. Um, I would say, like, despite my boyish good looks, I'm not a huge believer in this idea of internet radicalization, right? Um, you're more likely to join a terrorist organization if your best friend joins a terrorist organization, right? Mm -hmm. It helps to have that in-person connection. And we, right. I think, one of the, the, the biggest takeaways from the book is it's not that simple, right? When somebody gets arrested, um, the Associated Press will pull the Facebook page and there'll be a black banner flag on the Facebook profile and someone will say, okay, that's internet radicalization, Facebook radicalized them. And of course that person was online because the average age of an ISIS recruit was 26 and it would be silly if they weren't online, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, but when they're online with their best friend in the same room, right? Uh, and in fact, when you look at cases like Minneapolis, um, the brothers, sisters, and roommates of individuals who joined Al-Shabaab in Somalia two or three years ago were the same individuals who went to go join ISIS later. And so an in-person network um, does matter a great deal. Right. Well, hey, okay. I mean, you saw these smaller groups veer off, right? So mm -hmm. um, maybe they didn't get the support of kind of the mainstream um, organizations they wanted to, but they'd veer off into seven or eight people in a book club once a week and talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, a great example of that would be there's a, was an imam in Maryland uh, who was connected to at least six cases of ISIS cases um, here. Mm -hmm. Relatively fringe character, but um, did spend a good amount of time walking them through uh, ISIS beliefs. Right. Well, and I guess it becomes chicken and egg, right? Once you become radicalized because your friend has gotten you talking about these things, you go looking for the Facebook pages and the websites. Yeah. I mean, listen, no one, no one commits violence uh, uh, for the sake of violence. I mean, some people commit violence for the sake of violence, but very few do, right? We have to talk about extreme beliefs um, feeding into violent extremist um, actions. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm always surprised when I watch analysts say like, you know, something as if it just happens one day, right? Mm -hmm. Just one day someone commits an attack, whereas there's been a buildup, a slow progression down kind of the radicalization path um, through more and more radical beliefs until they can see violence as the only way out. Right. Well, and um, there are several questions that are trying to sort of uh, turn this back towards, you know, we, we've dealt with their protest movements in the United States today. Um, uh, when people think of Black Lives Matter in addition to the Boogaloo Boys, right, come at from different angles. But uh, there, I, I get the impression from the audience that lots of people want to know, is there a, uh, you know, based on your research, based on the work at the center, right, do we have a sense where people find their way from, you uh, radical discussions about a particular event in the United States, and then that then puts them on this path. Um, and because that's where when you talk about Minneapolis, right, you talk about people who are from Somalia. And so there is that specific Somali connection that leads people to Al Shabaab. But yep. what if what if I am a what if I am just a politically active uh, and maybe a little hot headed, but maybe not young person, you know, younger than I am, um, you know, who is uh, who starts out getting angry about a particular event in a particular city and finds my way to ISIS. Yeah, you know, that, that, there's a lot of steps in between. But how do you get from from uh, marching against the police in your hometown to deciding right. to become a terrorist? Yeah. Yeah, I, absolutely. So listen, let me disagree with myself ever so slightly. <laughs> so um, I would say that, you know, like I, like I talked about, the online environment 
is overplayed, but it also doesn't not exist. And yeah. so um, when we were looking at the program, we saw a number of cases of um, young men and women have questions about Syria, um, what's happening with Assad, and, and look for those questions on mainstream sites like Twitter. And then an ISIS recruiter would slowly introduce the ideology and narrative into yeah. the conversation over the course of a few weeks, and then move that person onto encrypted apps, right? Mm -hmm. So a grooming process similar to what you would see for say child predators or things like that. Um, and so there is a, again, a systematic approach to the, to the online space on that. Right. And, uh, a question that, uh, among other among other people, Elaine Jabour asked this about the the difference between the United States and Europe when it comes to the appeal to ISIS. You talk about this uh, to a great extent in the book, and so how would you bring that into this discussion? Yeah, it's night and day in, in many ways. Uh, you know, in Birmingham, it was not unusual for a Sharia for UK um, organization to hand out leaflets about how great the caliphate was, right? Whereas in contrast. You didn't see that happen in Times Square. There wasn't a, um, back in the day it was Revolution Muslim, but it wasn't a Revolution Muslim type of group handing out leaflets here. And so the infrastructure was a little bit different. Uh, in 2013, 14, you had to be kind of a moron not to figure out who to talk to in certain neighborhoods that had to travel when you're in Europe. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the US, it was a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. and I think that speaks to um, an aggressive law enforcement approach in the US and, and tools available. So. Uh, in the UK and parts of uh, in Europe in 2013, 14 timeframe, it wasn't illegal to travel to Syria and Iraq um, to fight for jihadist organizations, whereas in the US it was. Mm -hmm. So that allows for the FBI to interject themselves into the process earlier on before a network um, builds up, right? And so you're not seeing 15 people get on a plane at the same time, right? You're seeing ones and twos, threes and fours, and that's usually the, the cap uh, of folks. And that's because the FBI doesn't allow for those cells to form in any real meaningful way. I should also say it was, and again, my FBI colleagues would disagree with me, but it was a little bit easier in 2014 to, to arrest homegrown violent extremists because they were making an overt act, right? If you have somewhere to travel, so Syria, you buy the plane ticket to go to Turkey, that's the overt act and that's material support to terrorism. And bam, you've got a 20 year case you can make, right? Now look at now, uh, it's a lot more difficult uh, because you've got nowhere to travel. And so these guys aren't making the overt act. The FBI is having to roll up their sleeves, introduce informants, um, try a bunch of different law enforcement techniques, perhaps arrest them on a drug charge or a gun charge, or not the material sport terrorism case, right? Um, so it's a little bit harder. So ask me again where we are in networks in two or three years, and I think it'll be a different dynamic than where we were um, mm -hmm. four years ago. I, mean, I guess the temptation or the, the challenge for law enforcement has to be, right? Once you've identified somebody who is an extremist or is leaning towards ISIS, is do you watch them uh, or do you, do you grab them? Because uh, you can watch them and then they manage to slip away just in time to do something terrible. And everybody says, have you had this guy under surveillance? So I never know what's worse when somebody, when, it, when an act happens. Is it worse for the police to say, we've had this person under surveillance? Or is it worse for them to say, this person was not on our radar? Yeah. I think the answer <clears throat> is that they're, they're always under surveillance or under mm -hmm. on yeah. the FBI's radar. In yeah. fact, when you look at the 26 attacks that have happened um, in the U.S. inspired by ISIS, um, all but a handful had some touch point with the FBI prior, mm -hmm. maybe an assessment of preliminary investigation or full investigation. And so that speaks to, there's two ways to look at that. One is the FBI made some mistakes and they should have arrested someone. The other way to look at that is, what do you want from the FBI? Do you want them to watch someone for 10 years until they commit a violent attack? And what does that mean for civil rights and civil liberties, right? right. Um, I think there's probably somewhere in the middle on this, right? So the Garland shooters, the, the individuals who drove to from Arizona to Texas to uh, commit an attack at um, the drawing of, the, of, of Muhammad um, there, those were individuals that were under investigation by the FBI five years prior for Al-Shabaab. Um, hmm. And it's not unusual for this to happen. And so if we want to have this conversation, we probably need to have a larger conversation about um, Congress and oversight of the FBI, but more so um, tools available to law enforcement. And where do we want to strike that line between civil rights and civil liberties and aggressive homegrown uh, violent extremism investigations? Right. Uh, I, uh, the very first question that came in in the Q&A, which I've been holding on to, but I have to ask it, my colleague Lawrence Husek here at FPRI is curious, speaking of uh, aggressive 
tactics against terrorists is does the continued existence of Guantanamo still play a role in, uh, in recruiting for ISIS or in, in Islamist uh, complaints about the United States? No, I think they found other grievances to kind of play with. Um, you know, occasionally you'll see a general um, feeling of the need to free our brothers and sisters in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, a great example of that would be there was a brother, two brothers from Ohio who joined Al-Nusra, um, Al the terrorist mm -hmm. organization in Syria, right? One of the brothers dies, the other one comes back. Um, and when he comes back, uh, his plan is, and he's been directed by Al-Nusra to go free uh, a, a, a Al-Qaeda member in Texas who'd been held in, in a detention, um, a prominent female Al-Qaeda member. Mm -hmm. and so there was this idea of let's go free Lady Al-Qaeda. Lady Al We've got to do this for her. And so the narrative of freeing brothers and sisters is, is out there, but um, Gitmo just doesn't play, at least in the propaganda, the way it did. Um, it's kind of in the background noise, but it wasn't the, the main um, stick. Right. When you want, uh, oh, go ahead, please. One thing about that case to, to think about is, you know, we think about tripwires all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, what is the thing that's going to stop someone from doing that? Um, that case of those two brothers is a great example. So these two brothers go over there. One dies, the other one comes back. He's sent back by a terrorist organization to commit an attack here, right? Mm -hmm. He wasn't on the FBI's radar when he got back um, for a variety of different reasons. He's driving down the road and he runs a, a stop sign. And he gets stopped by a cop, right? And so instead of giving his ID, he, for some reason, gives him his brother's ID. And his brother is on the terrorism watch list. And so that's what starts triggering an FBI investigation down the road. So. It's a little bit of dumb luck of the guy giving the wrong ID, but it's also setting up the system where the local state can alert the FBI when a terrorism watch list suspect is getting stopped, right? Hmm. And so is that watch list, is it electronic? So basically I type in the information and it's, it's right, right there in my squad car when I'm arresting somebody? Yeah, depends on the case. Yeah. Uh -huh. Interesting. So Seamus Hughes comes up a lot for IRA, so. Uh, it's all <laughs> I bet it does. Uh, yeah, I, I, that, that, must, that must create some interesting conversations with yeah. uh, back in the days when people actually traveled. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm torn here because the questions go in two directions, specifically about Muslim extremism, but also about extremism more broadly. One factual question for Luke Williams, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the extremism tracker. Uh, and so does that just track, uh, ISIS related arrests or is it, it does it, uh, does it cover other extremists or other, you know, different kinds of groups as well? If someone just wanted to use that as a research. Yeah, so once Resource. a month, on the 15th of every month, we put out the extremism tracker. And so we do the ISIS numbers. We also do jihadism in general. And so okay. that looks at all um, terrorism cases that have gone on. So any court proceeding for Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda, um, Hamas, Hezbollah, things like that. Um, we're thinking about doing a, same, a similar parallel one for domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, but the bucketing, to be fair, is a little bit different and harder um, mm -hmm. for the, those cases, right? Um, so we're gaming that out a little bit more. Right, because I, I guess this is also as a Rishabh Chadi asked this question more broadly: is the uh, the issue of uh, you know how do we uh, how does counterterrorism policy deal with different sorts of of groups, and should we be focused on uh, sort of combating the growth of extremist organizations, or should we be trying to educate populations or communities more broadly in order to make them to, to sort of reduce the number of people who might find those organizations appealing? Yeah. I mean, in terms of the larger question of, of how do we approach these issues, right? Um, the material sort of terrorism clause uh, largely only applies to, to jihadist organizations. Right. Um, right. There's not a designated equivalent. You have to have a designated group to provide um, terrorism to, right? So that's right. ISIS. There's not a domestic equivalent for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and I don't see that happening in a short amount of time. And so we're not seeing people arrested for say, wanting to blow up um, the Supreme Court for some random reason that they want to, right? Uh, they're not getting arrested for material support. They're getting arrested for, for other charges. It's so, also forcing, I mean, to be fair, it's also forcing the FBI to be creative, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that case of the Boogaloo Boys in, in Minnesota, they were selling guns to an FBI undercover agent. Well, the FBI was clever enough to make that undercover agent a supporter of Hamas, and so they, then they could arrest them for material support to Hamas, to, to a terrorist organization. Um, and so they're trying to work their way around the laws a little bit um, because it hasn't caught up to what we're dealing with. I mean, because we get into the, as you say, the the very the very fraught and complicated issues of civil liberties um, that 
know, it's nice, I guess, when the FBI is creative and they catch a bad guy, but do we really want our police organizations to be creative in finding ways to get around, uh, get around existing laws that are supposed to restrict their, yeah. uh, their activities, right? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing no. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> probably not. But it is, but that, but that does, you know, I guess if someone claims to be connected to ISIS yeah. you know, or claims allegiance to ISIS, but they never leave the country, um, you know, uh, the, the line between sort of being connected to an international terrorist organization and being a domestic terrorist is awfully blurry. It, it is, yeah. Although um, most assistant U.S. attorneys can make the case that someone <laughs> has their support for ISIS, it's a pretty easy connection. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And most defense attorneys would argue that point of, how are you an ISIS member if you have no connections to anyone in ISIS? Um, right. I would say that, that in most cases, um, the judges always side with, with Department of Justice. Um, in fact, they're batting nearly a thousand when it comes to prosecuting terrorism cases, international terrorism cases. The only case that they lost um, in the ISIS world was um, the wife of Omar Mateen, the Pulse nightclub shooter, who a jury of the peers decided that they did not believe that she had foreknowledge of the attack and was not helping them scope out um, the location. And so, so she was, was she found not guilty of any crime at all? Not guilty of any crime. So moved on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a larger question, too. We've, we've got a lot, a lot of individuals. Um, we've had 220 people arrested for ISIS-related activities in the last four years, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the people get arrested and get um, the average prison sentence is 11.2 years, right? But some of the cases are one or two years. And so mm -hmm. we've got 16, 17 people who have been arrested for ISIS-related activities, federally charged, gone to jail, and are now out. Um, and there's not an apparatus to address um, that. And so most of them have moved on. And I've, I've interviewed a good number of them. Most of them have moved on or in college and trying to forget their past. And even some of them are trying to change their name uh, legally so they can go on Tinder and, and do a date, right? So there's a whole host of, of things like that. But um, there are some others that I've interviewed that I thought to myself, this person hasn't been radicalized. They've disengaged from violence, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, barring some level of support and monitoring, this is going to be a problem in a few years. Well, and and that's you know, usually this is this is uh, discussed. It, certainly, the Europeans talk a lot about the problem of the returning ISIS fighters, um, literally folks who made the trip and now are coming home. But uh, but there is also the question of people you manage to catch, you put them in jail, and then they get out of jail and they pay their debt to society, and yet you don't want to lose them completely from sight because you just don't know. How do we know, or how do we try to know yeah. when someone has de-radicalized? I mean, it's not as though it's not as though there's a, an antibody test that we can have people take. No, I've been studying this for 20 years, and I'm still not sure. Um, yeah. you know, you can sit across the table from somebody and get a good feeling about them after a mm -hmm. few days, but you never know at the end of the day, right? Um, I would say, listen, terrorism is a form of crime, mm -hmm. and all crime has recidivism, or at least mm -hmm. it has some level of recidivism. For terrorism cases, the recidivism rate, uh, rate tends to be um, smaller than larger um, population of criminals. Mm -hmm. So most people don't move back into other organizations. But there are notable exceptions. Right? Mm -hmm. um, John Georgilis from Texas was you know, defacing APAC's website with pro-Hamas um, um, messages, spends four or five years in jail, gets out, and then a couple months later gets on a plane and becomes a high-ranking member in ISIS. Right? So, you do have a level of recidivism sometimes. I should also say that um, the, there's not an apparatus to deal with this, right? Mm -hmm. Probation officer doesn't know what they're looking for when they come out. Right. Judge sometimes sentences uh, an individual to um, no super supervision all the way to lifetime supervision, right? Uh, the U.S. attorney doesn't know when they move. The local FBI office sometimes gets alerts, sometimes they don't. But if they get the alert, you know, even though someone's been convicted of a terrorism crime and been, has been released, that may not rise to a level of being allowed to open an FBI investigation when they get out, right? They've mm -hmm. committed their crime. There hasn't been another crime they've committed. And so the, it's not legally allowed to put three guys in a van doing eight hour shifts watching this individual um, because they haven't crossed the threshold. I should also say just a general resource um, issue. Sure. You don't have three guys in a van uh, on every person who gets out. Just right. Um, not enough manpower. Well, and, and because that is, so it's, it's a, it's a practical question. It is a civil rights question. Uh, and yet nobody ever wants to, nobody wants to, uh, to be the, 
the U.S. attorney or the local police chief who has to say, yes, we knew about this person, but we thought he had gotten out of the business of jihading. Um, uh, Elian Jabour has a question that is, is both very specific, but I want to sort of tease it out more broadly. And that is, she's a, a young American woman married to an ISIS militant, was a 20-year-old college student. She joined ISIS in 2014. She used Twitter to encourage terrorist attacks in the West. She said to the New York Times that she regrets it and wants to return to the United States. And this gets to the question of people returning from ISIS, especially, especially the spouses and children question as well. But um, uh, what is the legal status of people who manage to get to the caliphate? Um, and, and is the situation in the United States different from other countries? Yeah. So in, in that distinct um, case, um, there's a legal limbo happening right now because the mm -hmm. Obama administration argued that uh, Hoda Mathana was not a U.S. citizen to begin with because her ah. father was a diplomat um, for Yemen when she was born here. Um, I had the opportunity to interview um, her family and her Ooh. friends um, for the book. Um, I think it's an interesting case. Um, I would also say that you know her Twitter feed when she was there was quite aggressive, um, to put it lightly. Mm -hmm. And so um, she may have a, a, a turn of heart when she's sitting in a, in a camp, but um, when she was under the trappings of ISIS, it was a different story publicly, at least. Um, now, most of our, the U.S. has a pretty good track record of bringing back our citizens um, who joined ISIS. Uh, we've, we've brought back nearly two dozen. Um, most of those individuals are charged with material support to terrorism. Most of those individuals come back disillusioned, disenchanted. Most of them plead out um, as soon as they get here, right? They just plead guilty. Um, and so that makes life a lot easier for all parties involved if you just know you're going to grab the person from, from uh, Syria, put them in a jail in Supermax in Colorado. It's not a hard uh, decision. Mm. It's a harder decision if you're in, say, in France and you're dealing with 500 returnees um, and you've got to make that decision. And you don't have a material support to terrorism clause that the FBI does. Mm -hmm. and so you have no charges against them. So right. you know, it's, it's one thing if you know you're investi under investigation. It's another thing if, if uh, you can't do anything about it. Right, especially if because the, the simple act in, in other countries, the simple act of traveling to the caliphate was not a crime. Right. And listen, and it's also, um, we, we front ended our stuff. So mm -hmm. a lot of our folks that came out um, from ISIS came out in the early days. Mm -hmm. um, and so they all um, tended to have regrets. The ones that are left that are kind of still out there are, tend to be true believers through and through. And so mm -hmm. it's not incumbent on them to, to admit guilt immediately which means you got to prove it in a court of law. You got to declassify information. You've got a chain of custody on what happened in, in Syria and how do you get it to a, a courthouse in Eastern District of Virginia. And so that, those are harder cases. Um, and I think DOJ will be against a, up against a problem in a few years. Hmm. Well, and- uh, And I'm yeah. sorry, there's one more thing. Oh, keep... please go ahead, Seamus, go ahead. Is, um, we've actually got a lot of Americans that are um, currently in foreign custody for, for terrorism activities. Oh. So a number of Americans who joined ISIS are currently in jails in Turkey. A number of Americans who joined, say, or tried to join TTP uh, are in jail in Pakistan. And mm -hmm. so it raises the question of double jeopardy, right? So if you mm -hmm. spend 10 years in the Pakistani jail for trying to join a terrorist organization, do you come back to the States and spend another 20 years in jail for that same crime, but a different legal system? Um, law, the law says, yes, you, it's not double jeopardy. You can get right. charged for it. Um, but DOJ is going to have to make the decision of whether they're going to bring back, knowingly bring back people who spent time in a foreign jail for terrorist organization, but are not going to charge them on the back end. Because right, that's a challenge. Because I can imagine that, uh, well, I, I, let's put it this way. I, I can't imagine that spending 10 years in a Pakistani jail is going to make me feel um, softer or you know, yeah, is, is going to make me feel less unhappy, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and well, and what that, that actually gets to the question I see down here at the bottom of this from, from Amber Chakar, the, the idea of um, you know, the demographics of ISIS recruits. Um, you know, this gets back to the issues of what makes the United States situation different from other places. Um, you know, who, are these, who are these recruits? Uh, my understanding from reading your book is that when we talk about American, uh, ISIS, uh, uh, American ISIS recruits are generally wealthier, uh, generally better situated, perhaps even better integrated into society than their co-religionists from, say, France. Yeah. Um, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's fair to say for the Muslim American population in general in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that probably tracks for the cases 
Um, the one of the frustrating points of the book, and I think frustrating for law enforcement too, is there's not a typical profile of an ISIS recruit, right? Um, they're old, they're young, they're rich, they're poor, they're black, they're white, um, they're converts and they're reverts. And so there's, they all share the same ideology uh, and narrative of, of ISIS, but the way they come after it is, is quite different. Um, mm. A few points that seem to be similar, they tend to be younger, um, mm -hmm. they tend to be male, about 90% of the cases are, are male, um, and they tend to be U.S. citizens. So when we talk about homegrown terrorism, we truly mean homegrown terrorism. Mm -hmm. They were born and raised here, right? Um, the occasional case of an individual who, was, uh, who wasn't was born here when they were, or came here when they were two and committed an attack when they were 22, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's not, that's not a, a sleeper cell. It's a coma cell, right? It, it barely woke up. And so um, most of this tends to be U.S. citizens. And so what then is the role of, what, what's then the role of, of mosques and imams that we see in this recruiting? How much, how much of it can work through, you know, let's say, otherwise respectable religious organizations versus people who find their way because of cousin is more radical than they are? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that was one of the questions in the last chapter of the book is, what do you do about this? Um, and I spent a good amount of time in the intelligence community at the National Counterterrorism Center working on countering violent extremism. And so that basically meant when something bad happened, they put me on a plane, again, back mm -hmm. when you could fly. Um, you know, bomb goes off in Boston and two men commit the attack. An imam will call me and say, come talk to my congregation about preventing the next two guys from doing that. And those are awkward but important conversations. Uh, I would say that those were happening, happening more frequently in 2014 and 15 and less frequently now. Um, people are less willing to have those conversations. And I think some of that is a reflection of, of the numbers of arrests dropping, and so it's not in the news. Um, but some of that also is just a general fatigue of, of government engagement. And so I think the one way to get around it is to look at a program like um, DEEP in New York, like mm -hmm. a good government program, it's got an acronym DEEP. And so um, what it does is takes um, formers and, has, and uses former extremists to engage with um, current extremists. So I interviewed a guy who was in Syria, um, an American who, who left New York and, and joined ISIS for a couple months and came back. Um, the Department of Justice used him as a, a basically a no-knock. He'd show up on the door, knock on the door and say, hey, my name is Mo. Um, I hear you thinking about joining ISIS. I joined ISIS and that's a really bad idea. And here's why, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Now, the only way you do that is if you have a level of trust to know that Mo is not going to um, go south on you. Uh, and the other way they did it was they used it on cases of minors. The FBI has a hard, and, and the Department of Justice is hard up on, on, on charging a 17-year-old for material support terrorism or right. a 15-year-old. And so if you can try different means on that, I think they're, they're keen to do that. So that's, a, so that's like an ISIS, that's a terrorism version of, of scared straight. Yeah, some, some level of that. And, you know, it had some level of effectiveness, although you never know with these things. Um, you know, you're talking about three or four cases here and there by, by Mao and then three or four for another guy and three or four for another guy. And so you don't really get a sense of whether you can implement that across the world. Um, right. I should also say that, you know, in New York, that's an easy program to implement because no one's going to um, argue that New York is soft on terrorism. You know, they've been prosecuting dozens of cases every year. And so they know what they're doing and they, they take this seriously, right? And so if they try a non-law enforcement approach for a case, it's because they've exhausted all the other options. They want to try something new. I don't right. know if that same approach would have worked in, in other um, states. Right, because the because the the temptation, or let's say the initial reflex, is to be hard yeah. rather than soft. Um, to to broaden the frame briefly, because we we've got about ten minutes to go, but uh, uh, Lawrence Husa comes back with a question that I wanted to ask you, and that is the relationship between ISIS and uh, other geopolitical adversaries of the West. So uh, we know, for example, that Russia has its own uh, uh, jihadism problem, its own struggle with Islamism, and sometimes uses the struggle against Islamism to argue for closer relations with the United States right. and the Chinese as well. And yet, um, do, we see, do we see any efforts by ISIS um, or organizations like ISIS who want to target the United States? Do they put aside their their problems with, say, Russia and China um, in order to seek their help against us, or do they just strike out in all directions? I think they strike out in all directions, but, you know, they occasionally are strategic, right? So mm -hmm. if you can make a deal on the ground to get your guys across the town and not get bombed by 
uh, Wagner, then, then do so, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say in the early days, you did see some tacit uh, approval of, of folks traveling through Turkey um, to Syria and Iraq. You know, I just talked about Mo, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When Mo got to Turkey and he got to the border, he goes to the border and um, he's running across. And he's going to go meet another guy across who's going to pick him up. He gets stopped by Turkish border officials. They rob him and then point him on the way to Syria, right? And so it was a, basically a no man's land uh, or a wild, wild west back uh, in 2013, 14. I think um, uh, they've clamped down since and they've done some good work on, on biometrics, but it was looking the other way. This is somebody else's problem, at least um, in the short term, and a good smuggling route in terms of, um, of drone parts and things like that. Right. And of course, that is that would be uh, the United States NATO ally, Turkey. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, very, I mean, Turkey is an interesting animal when you, when you talk about um, you know, support of Islamism in general and Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, it's just a different dynamic. I will, I will say there's at least one question about the Muslim Brotherhood, but we've already had Lawrence uh, Lorenzo on the show, I should say, to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood. But um, is there any connection? I mean, uh, you know, officially, unofficially, or even as a, uh, uh, as a sort of overlapping interest, right? That the, the, does the Brotherhood have any role to play either in uh, encouraging extremism or in fighting extremism? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean, I think any objective um, observer would say that, um, Muslim Brother is not a, a moderate organization by any means, um, especially when you look at their their um, beliefs on um, gay rights or any number of other things too, just looking at, at general societal um, goods. I mean, there's a question of, of legal uh, allowing and then societal allowance, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I would defer heavily to my colleague, Lorenzo, who has studied the Brotherhood um, in many ways in, in the West. Um, I would say occasionally you saw an ISIS member um, come out from kind of the, the Aquani kind of network, um, but not a level of support um, in a systematic way. Fair. And I do encourage uh, all, all uh, watchers right now, if you are curious, right, Lorenzo Vadino's appearance on what, what what used to be called Geopolitics with Granary is also available on the FPRI YouTube site. Um, so uh, in the in the remaining time, right, we've been circling around this question of, of uh, radicalization, right? What does it mean to, toss, to call somebody radical, right? A radical is, uh, you know, uh, to a certain extent, right? Radical is a very useful term to declare certain positions or attitudes out of bounds, right? There are criminal acts, um, but are there criminal thoughts? Um, this is a, uh, you know, certainly in a society that, that emphasizes civil rights, right? We want to believe that there are no criminal thoughts uh, unless they turn into criminal acts. Right. And so, but how do we um, and how does, based on your experience with sort of keeping, you know, we want to make sure that we identify people whose uh, thoughts might lead them to acts. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, how does your research, you, know, you with your colleagues, how does your research uh, deal with this question of, you know, are there best practices for figuring out, not just with, uh, not just with Islamism, not just with jihadism, not just with ISIS, but even when we talk about other um, extremist groups. I mean, we are living in an extremely fragmented society. We're living in a society where people are very quick to believe the worst of their of people who disagree with them, which can, so they both attribute radical ideas to the people they disagree with, but that also then feeds radical ideas within communities who feel that they have to defend themselves against the other radicals. Yep. And so how can or should a free society uh, manage this sort of keeping track of the potential dangers without restricting freedom uh, of without restricting freedom of thought. Yeah, I mean, I think it just comes down to the role of government versus the role of civil society. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, I am increasingly uncomfortable with the role of government when it comes to extreme thought and policing extreme thought. In fact, I'm actually increasingly uncomfortable with the role of technology companies in policing extreme thought too. Um, and I think we've largely ceded a counterterrorism responsibility to private companies, private multi-billion dollar companies in Silicon Valley. And so I think that that is an inherently governmental function and we may want to discuss that um, mm -hmm. large, uh, in a large way. And we're going to it soon, I think. Um, but a lot of these things, when we talk about like, it, if you join ISIS, that's the FBI's job, right? If you think ISIS is a great idea, but you don't want to join it, or you think the caliphate in general is a good idea, but you don't want to join ISIS, that's, that's your, your father, your mother, or your local mentor, or your religious leader's job to deal with this. Um, right. Now, the question is whether government can set up uh, ways to make that easier to do so. 
So a great example of that would be, um, you know, I interviewed a lot of religious leaders who were interested in doing engagements with um, gentlemen who joined ISIS, but were concerned about ending up on a terrorism watch list because they were talking to a known or suspected terrorist, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that seems like an easy lift, right? You, you talk to the FBI and say, you know, these guys are okay. They're talking to these guys in this limited fashion for this limited reason. And this is why, you know, don't, hit them against on a secondary screen every time they fly in a plane. Right. Uh, or at least don't do it for the next two years, right? So um, we can lower the bar on that. We can lower the bar in terms of um, allowing people to engage online, right? I know what material support terrorism is. I know that if an ISIS member, and this happened, an ISIS member reaches out to me and says, can you send me court records so I can figure out how to sneak past the airport, right? She said it nicer, but that was basically your question, right? I know not to send that to her because that's material support terrorism. Right. I'm not. I'm not confident that, that an NGO member in uh, Minneapolis knows that level of detail, where an innocent question may get them hit, hit up against material support. So, if we can provide the right and left latitudes of what's allowed um, uh, on that, I think it would be be useful. And the, finally, the, the point I would circle back on was, um, I think it's a very important one. This idea of reciprocal radicalization, we we can't deny, right? Um, the attacks, uh, ISIS attacks, then feed. Um, far right attacks and back and forth in this endless cycle of polarization. And at some point we're gonna to have to figure out how to break it. Um, I'm increasingly concerned um, on the direction of where extremism is going in the US um, in, the, in a number of years, mostly because um, we're all moving to our own little silos. And if you don't hear any dissenting voices, if you don't um, talk to anyone who disagrees with you, um, you get to a point where violence is, is an acceptable means. Which is uh, which feeds into my last question for you. I think you've partially answered it, and that is, you know, what do you see in the future? Um, the nature of uh, the jihadist threat, but the nature of the threat of extremism going forward, uh, both, you know, in the, in the era of COVID, uh, is the the lack of personal contact does that perhaps make things? Uh, are we safer as a result? Um, but also, how do we think going forward in an in an increasingly siloed society? Um, what's the what's the future for radical recruitment? Yeah, the, the one positive thing from COVID is we're going to test whether I'm, I'm right or wrong. And you can call me a liar or uh, incorrect next year, which is a question of online radicalization. Mm -hmm. If you can't meet people in person, um, does the number of people that join ISIS um, diminish greatly uh, yeah. or does it increase because everyone's online all the time? And goes in there. So we're going to settle the debate within terrorism research as to whether online radicalization is a thing or not. Um, so I, I'm happy about that. That's the one thing I'm happy about COVID. Um, the, where do I see this going? I think, like I said before, we're going to see a, a mixing of cocktails of ideologies, at least in the short term, especially in the in the domestic terrorism uh, realm. Um, you know, you're going to see sovereign citizens float into incels, to float into neo Nazis, to float into everything in between, and it's not going to be as clear cut. And I think. I don't think Congress is caught up on this either. You know, they're, they're demanding that, that the FBI uh, bucket the cases. You know, how many ISIS cases do you have? How many white supremacist cases have? How many incel cases do you have? And the idea is that you could put resources against it. Well, you can't, a lot of these cases, you're not gonna be able to bucket. They're gonna float in and out of these things. And so um, I don't think we should think about it at, in a very black and white way uh, in the way we have before. And, <laughs> I think we're probably going to see smaller attacks, um, one-offs, ones and twos, probably not large-scale attacks, um, knock on wood, um, but at least smaller attacks. And then the ISIS world is, and a lot of people lost focus on, on ISIS cases. Um, I didn't, and, and damned if we didn't have an arrest once a month for the last 12 months. And so we'll still have these cases popping up. It will not be the same level as 2015 with 70 plus cases, but, um, but I don't think we can ignore it. Right. Well, I am sorry to say that uh, that, that is a, I, I don't know if that's hopeful or not, but unfortunately that's where we're going to have to leave it for today. We have gone through our entire hour of conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is Homegrown, ISIS in America. Uh, Seamus Hughes was our guest today, along with his co-authors, Alexander Melligrew Hitchens and Bennett Clifford. Uh, we thank you very much, uh, Seamus Hughes, for joining us today to talk about your work. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We really do appreciate your interest in FPRI. We thank our sponsors and partners for making this possible. Uh, and we also, since we are recording this on Giving Tuesday, I would appeal to all of you to think about how you would like to encourage this kind of work at FPRI uh, going forward. 
Um, today's conversation is just the beginning. The world goes on and we will be here to discuss it at FPRI. If you have enjoyed our discussion today, please tell a friend, bring a friend next time when we gather to analyze our complex world. To keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose and other events at FPRI, visit our website, fpri.org, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. But until next time, for all of us at FPRI, and with special thanks to my research intern, Paul Broderick, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us.